Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Chatham, Kent, Ontario, Councillor Allison Story. But before we get into today's interview, I want to take a moment and ask you to do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this today, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, if you're watching this. Because you don't want to miss more great content like the one you're about to see today. Um, Your dedication to municipal issues is what strives, keeps us going in some sense, and it helps us to continue to grow and bring more great content like you're about to see today. So with that, thank you so much for tuning in. And now on to our interview with Councillor Allison Story. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about yourself and talking about the community of Chatham-Kent. But I want to start with the big question that I've asked all my guests who's ever come on the show. So you're no exception to this first question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I want to thank you, first of all, Chris, for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And all the work you're doing to share municipal issues across the, the country and around the world. So thank you for doing that on our behalf. Thank but you. I just I uh for me personally, I think my sense of duty to serve really came from my family. My uh dad, my grandpa, my mom, my grandma, both my grandmas, they were all in service clubs. And primarily in Rotary, actually. And I am also a Rotary member here in Chatham, the Rotary Club of Chatham. And I watched them growing up. And it actually wasn't an actively conscious thought. I just grew up watching my dad go to Rotary meetings and coming with him to Rotary events where they would, you know, plant trees or help folks who were struggling or, you know, our, one of our primary goals with Rotary is to eradicate polio. So working on polio eradication. My mom was in the Maycourt Club, which is a similar service club. I'm not sure how widely spread the Maycourt Club is, but that was a local service club for women who ran a thrift shop and really advocated for kids and education. So it was never really even talked about as an option, to be honest. It was just always something that we did. And so growing up, that was just something that our family was part of, that was part of our daily lives. So when I got older, I kept that sense of service within me. And when I moved back to Chatham, because I went away to university, then I lived in Toronto and I lived overseas and I returned to Chatham, Kent, about 15 years ago now. And when I was settled, I realized that I wanted to do something similar. So I joined the Rotary Club and that really helped build my leadership skills. I was president of the club and the different responsibilities within that club helped launch me into more community advocacy. So that was definitely the real, the seed was planted with my parents who were always really community minded and still are. And what I wanted to continue to do that. So that was the general sense of service for me and my family. But I think maybe you're also asking, was there a turning point where you really decided? Which which I was about to get into. But before I get into that, so you decide to get into the political realm. But I got to know, was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because I came to politics in Ontario as well. So I, I, I know the uh, I know Ontario quite well for municipalities because my aunt was the mayor of Scugog. I ran for municipal politics in Clarington, Ontario. My uh, my grandmother ran. So we, we had a long line of history with politics and it was all levels of government, provincial, federal, municipal. But for you, you make a decision to run municipally. So I've got to ask, were you interested in municipal politics prior to entering municipal politics? Or did it come later to life that I've, for you, like I've heard from countless stories across Canada? You know, it's funny. We did not really talk politics a lot around the dinner table. We talked about current events. We all, I come from a very... uh, we read. My family reads every room in all of our homes. There are stacks of books. My TBR to be read pile is never ending. Um, we had we subscribed to multiple newspapers growing up. So every morning, all of us around the table reading 
the London Free Press, the Globe and Mail, the Chatham Daily News, the D Detroit Free Press, because my mom is from Michigan. So we were we are news junkies. And so I, I still am. We still are. So we didn't necessarily talk about politics specifically, but we talked about what was going on in the world, locally, provincially. So I wouldn't say that we were political junkies per se, but we were definitely big consumers of news, which of course has politics as part of it, but, but it wasn't necessarily an active discussion about politics per se. So, but I think as a, an elected official, you clearly need to be informed about what's happening both in your own backyard and globally, because as we know more than ever, global forces impact us locally in a big way. But we didn't have uh, a strong political bent in our family. I, what This is what's so interesting. We, as far as I know, I, have, I don't have any elected officials in my family. I am the first one that I am aware of in our general uh, tr family tree. But my dad, I mean, my, my dad is so funny. I love him dearly, but he's a man of few words. And when I ran for municipal, for a counselor here in Chatham, Kent, my dad said to me, oh, well, you know, Grandpa Joe was an alderman. I was like, what? <laughs> he never, I'm in my 40s. He never bothered to mention that my grandfather was actually an alderman, which was essentially in the 50s and 60s. That was a reference to a counselor for the city of Chatham. And so for, and they only had one year terms, which blows my mind, but they had one year terms back then. And so he was an alderman for like in the mid fifties. So okay. my first, yeah. So there was one person, my grandpa Joe, who was also extremely community minded in Chatham. He was an architect who designed many of our most, I think, important buildings in southwestern Ontario and in Chatham. But so my first council meeting, I looked because we have all the little council meeting photos all along the uh, hallway leading into the chambers. And I actually found him in the two photos right above the door, ironically, where you walk into the council chambers. Wow. And I would never have looked because, I mean, there's a lot of these photos, right? And I would never have looked at those photos otherwise and now i see his little face and his his little body along with the council chamber photo so that actually so i do have one person but it was never even talked about before, before i actually was elected so i, I i've got to ask this question then on that on that story just alone does it give you a sense of awe that you're making decisions that your grandfather at one time probably was dealing with? Because let's be honest, uh, the, the, this, the changes in our, 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 our communities, our changes in our governments are, are substantial, but the issues are still the same. You're still dealing with roads, you're still dealing with garbage, you're still dealing with water mains, and you're looking at issues that your grandfather would have looked at. 50, well, now 70 years ago. So is it kind of serendipitous and going, I, I, I'm in my grandfather's shoes right now? It is. It really is. It's such a neat connection. And he unfortunately died very young. He died only a few months after I was born. So I never got to meet him and, or get to know him. I was, a, I was just a newborn. But uh, to have that connection to him is really special. It really is. And what's even more special, add another layer, the council, the Civic Center, our city hall, was he designed that. He was the architect of our Civic Center. So I sit in the council chambers that he designed. So that's really, it's really neat. It really is. It's a, a very interesting connection that I feel very grateful for to be surrounded. I didn't get to know him really personally, but I get to know him through his his civic duties, his legacy through his architecture. So that's really something that I do I do not take for granted at all. And it's really, it's really special for sure. I feel like I could talk about the subject for an hour just in itself, but I want to turn back to you for a few <laughs> minutes. So in 2022, you decide that you're going to put your name for it for municipal politics. What was the catalyst? What was the catalyst to say, finally, okay, it's Allison's time. It's Allison's time to put her name on the ballot in this election because there's an issue or I believe my voice needs to be there. What was it for you? Well, I actually have a perhaps a slightly different path, um, but I ran for mayor in 2018. So I actually 
had a kick at the can. Okay. The previous term where I ran for mayor first. And I was told in no uncertain terms by many people that I, how dare I run for mayor when I haven't been on council first? How dare you? So I, but I've truly felt in 2018, there was a major shift in the political um, scene here. There was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, th a three-term mayor who was, an in, was you know, well-established. There was an incumbent from council as well running, and there were three other, there were five older white men running. And I felt that I had a voice that was not being heard, that I represented folks that were not being represented at the council table. And I thought that we needed some female leadership at the top, quite frankly. And I felt that I had the skills and the expertise and the energy and the enthusiasm to run. So long story short, I did not win, but I came in second. And I came in second by a large number for a female, a first time female candidate. So I was really proud of that. I really was. Can I and... ask you a question and interrupt? I apologize to do this. Sure. And I, I yeah. hate doing this because you just said something that kind of irked me yeah. a little bit. And I just want to get, I dive into a little bit here, but you said people came up to you and said, how dare you run for mayor without being on council? Now, I just sat down with four amazing counselors from across Canada who happen to be women, and they talked about their experiences. Now, I see that you're wearing a Madam Premier shirt where a woman's <laughs> place is in a council chamber. So I think it says a legislature in the House of Commons. Yes. yes. Do you think sex had to, uh, your gender had anything to do with that statement being thrown at you? Do you think if you were a man, that statement would not have been thrown at you? Honestly, and I apologize to I ask it that way. I just I find that a fascinating statement that you made. And I just want to know, where do you think people were coming? Where is it just your inexperience or was it possibly your gender playing a role in there? Well, I, I think I, to be frank, I think it was both. I did not have the traditional council experience that traditionally we expect for candidates. My mm -hmm. point in running was that there are many paths to leadership and council doesn't have to be the only path as a counselor to mayor. There are lots of very qualified people who could be mayor, be very effective and not serve on council first. I also had worked for this municipality for almost a decade previous. So I was well-versed in municipal operations, but that is another story. So I I know very I, I had very much a strong knowledge of our municipal organization corporately as it was. But I felt well. I mean I could we could speak for another hour on this because the the store the the statements that were made to me, the things that were I was subjected to as a female as a solo female candidate in that race were offensive and beyond belief to be frank. And I was told, I was told flat out from someone that I shouldn't, women couldn't be mayor, <laughs> which is, I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's, I mean, so I, I just say that because in 2018, there were folks who were flat out telling me that women couldn't be mayor. And that's maybe because there hadn't been a women mayor in like 20 years. We've only had two female mayors in 200 years of Chatham and Chatham can. So it's not like we've seen a lot of them yet i i feel but, like i'm gonna have to do another breaking the glass ceiling with more uh female counselors and mayors because i think this story is something that we need to talk about a little bit more but i, I want to get back to 2022 now so you you lose and i say lose because at the end of the day you did you came second yep. but you lost the mayor election in 2018 in 2022 you decide i'm gonna put my name forward again but this time i'm not gonna run for mayor i'm gonna go and run for counselor what was the decision about making that step from mayor to counselor? Well, I, at that point, it was a few different things. Um, I did not expect to run again in the near future. The, the running for mayor was so toxic. The, uh, the experience was so, I mean, it was amazing, but also deeply unpleasant. Like the, the harassment I was subjected to as the female candidate was really, um, it was really, damaging and traumatizing so I did not expect I would I wasn't sure I would ever run again after that experience but enough time had passed and there were 
really two issues that galvanized me to run in this particular election that I felt were not being addressed at the time and that I wanted to put forward and shine some light on. So there were, you know, there were issues locally that I wanted our community to pay attention to. And I felt that if that's what I wanted, I needed to put my money where my mouth is and run and raise awareness about these issues and and start talking about them. But I want, I'll, I can just jump back one quick second because there wasn't also the political reason why I ran. I, I was given an opportunity that I never would have wished for, what I would never wish on anyone, but which started showing me that my voice mattered and that I could do hard things to use the title of a popular book right now. But a f- close friend of mine was killed in a car accident on Highway 401, which is in Ontario, the main for uh, main highway that goes the length of the province on the southern border. But she and her five-year-old daughter were killed in a crossover collision, and her six-year-old son was severely injured. And that happened in 2017. And the reason why they were that collision occurred because there was no median barrier in the 401 to prevent cars from crossing over. And there's a median barrier between Windsor and Tilbury, and then it starts again at London. But our whole section is was out was empty and there was constant crossovers and multiple fatalities and the government of the day of the days because there were multiple never did anything about it so i was not i did not accept that result um and it was born out of a horrible tragedy that we still all feel the effects of but so i started lobbying government and i had no idea what i was doing quite frankly, but we just, there was a group of us that I helped lead that we went to Queens Park. We lobbied ministers of transportation. We had social media campaigns. We wrote petitions. We did all sorts of things. And I was told over and over again, the government's not going to do this. They don't have any, they're not, this is not a priority to build this infrastructure in Chatham Kent. Save your breath, save your time. Well, long story short, we got a commitment to build it and it is starting to be built. There's already a section built in the Western section of our of our stretch. So there's a message I can send is that you don't give up. And if people tell you, you can't do it, often you can, you got to work your tail off. But that was that was really the shift when I thought, oh my gosh, I can actually have a positive impact on my community and in this case save lives but it doesn't have to be something quite as dramatic it can be something in your community like a school closing or you know clean water or a road being improved it can be any number of things a library staying open what have you but that was the first time in my adult life that I ever thought I could run for office and and have a voice and help other people so that until then it was really quite recently that i even thought i could be an elected official so just to to add that into my origin story (laughs) i i I appreciate your honesty and your candor there Uh, you were coming up to one year in being in office so last october you were elected we are airing this in october so you are one month one year into your first term is it what you expected? Is the job of a municipal councillor what you expected prior to being elected to being here now, one year in? I would say yes and no, which is probably the least favorite answer from a podcast interviewer. But I would say... On or a politician. Front... <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking out of both sides of my mouth. But truthfully, I would say the majority is quite similar from what I expected. We do a lot of community advocacy. We have a lot of different discussions about local issues. We have, you know, from very day-to-day items up to really big infrastructure, you know, substantial issues that affect our entire community because we are a single tier government versus a a city or a town. We amalgamated in 1998 from 23 municipalities into one. So that is a unique situation that Chatham, the municipality of Chatham-Kent is in. 
So we have a lot of different needs in a lot of different areas. But the one thing I will say I did not expect is the vitriol. Uh, we've had a few real contentious issues that have come to our council. In some cases, that really have nothing to do with municipal government. They are issues that are addressed by other levels of government. But the amount of harassment and abuse that our counselors have been subjected to has really been shocking. It's been shocking. And it's really unpleasant. And it's not just towards me, although I have received it. It's towards any of us who have voted in certain ways on certain issues. And this October, I don't want to get into the weeds too much about it, but I think you can probably figure out which issues right now in 2023 are really contentious ones with certain segments of the population. So I, 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 I can't been... imagine, but I can imagine. Yeah. So I, I, I do want to the... ask one question though about that because sure. you're there to make the tough choices and you make tough choices on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I, I quote Scott Pierce all the time, president of FCM, but I have to quote him because he gave me the best quote that I could ever say. You guys are the government of proximity. You are the ones that make the decisions and impact them the next day. Your decisions don't get impacted six months or 10 years from now. They get impacted the next day. A motion you make impacts tomorrow. Absolutely. How do you how do you bear that responsibility when you go into that council chamber and make those tough decisions? Because you have to make the tough decisions that better your community as a whole. And I speak as Chatham Kent as a whole. Uh, how do you see yourself in ensuring that when you go in, you're making the right choice that's going to benefit the entire community and move it forward without forgetting about the people also that it could impact, whether it be financial issues, whether it be service level issues? Is there a balance that you put on yourself and a weight that you put on yourself? Absolutely. There are huge decisions that we make that affect people's everyday lives from small to to major. And it is it is a lot of pressure. And I think, I mean, I can't speak for other counselors, but from what I can tell, we all take that very seriously. That is not something we take lightly, the decisions that we make every week at the council table. So for me personally, and I want to give a shout out to President Scott, because I am a new board member at FCM, and I, Scott is amazing, and he is such an amazing representative, and I have learned a lot from him. He is just a, he's a rock star. So, but he's absolutely right. We are the government of proximity, and most folks don't often understand the different levels of government and who does what. And so we're often the folks, you're not going to often see the prime minister in the grocery store next week. You're going to see me probably or at the gas station or at the public school meeting or what have you, right? So if you have an issue, you're going to probably, and you see me in the street, what have you, you're going to ask me about it, whether it's federal, provincial, or otherwise. And I'm always happy to chat about it because I love to chat about things like this, but I will also make it clear if there's something that I can do about it as a counselor or not. And that I think is something that we have a responsibility to do because we can't be all things to all people. And that is a real struggle. When I get calls from residents about issues that I cannot help with, that is heartbreaking for me. Maybe that's because I'm still new and you maybe have to build more of a thick skin and more of a some mental protection to accept that you can't help everyone. And if there's someone who has an issue with their school or something else, I can direct them to their MPP or their MP or a specific department, but often there are things that I cannot do. And you, generally speaking, we're running to help people. So when you don't have the solution for them, that that is tough. That's a tough one. So, but uh, so on, just... on that note, sorry, I, I, I want to stick on that this question here. I want to stick on that topic here for a second. On that note, in 2018, you ran for mayor. In 2022, you ran for councillor. You were elected as councillor, and you are now an elected official. I believe, and I say this painting a very broad stroke brush here, that people don't understand the jurisdictional rules and areas that levels of governments are responsible for, whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal. 
And I don't, I don't think they don't know. I think they don't care because I think they, like you just said, they come to you. They want you to fix it as an elected official. Are you seeing a, uh, a blurring of jurisdictional lines since when you first ran in 2018 to 2023 when you've been elected now for a year where you're saying seeing more people talking about provincial issues with municipal politicians or even federal issues with municipal politicians and you're going it, it's not in our wheelhouse i'd love to help you but unfortunately it's a provincial here's your mp i will happily call your mpp your mp to get them to contact you but i just in my jurisdictional role as a municipal counselor, I can't help you as as you want me to. That is a great question. I think the big difference between 2018 and 2022 or 2023 today is we just had a massive generational crack, like a shift in our society, which was the pandemic. And we really, the, our society is still recovering from that and on so many levels. And we likely will be for, I mean, who knows how long we, we can't predict, but the trust in government during that time uh, has really, depending on the segment of the population you're talking to has gone down substantially. So your point about do they want to or care about who does what? I'm not sure, to be honest. I think when you're struggling or suffering with an immediate issue, you are not always thinking about, well, who is actually supposed to fix this? You're like, well, I know Allison, so I'm going to give her a call. And she's my counselor, and I see her in the paper, or I've heard her on the radio, or what have you, right? So I'm not sure that often those thought processes are that specific to to think about who does this. All I know is, you know, my road needs fixing or my kid is sick and my ER, I had to wait in the ER for 12 hours yesterday. That's not acceptable. So there are issues that folks, when you're in crisis, you may not stop and think about who I'm supposed to call for that, but you know me, so you will call me. I, I definitely think there are a range of answers to that. I would like to think it's less because they don't care than we just have been in crisis survival mode for so long now that we've kind of lost the time. I don't want to say the ability in, the, in a negative way, but we've, we're all in this heightened sense of alertness, right? And it's been hard to come. You can't live like that for that long and not have it affect how you approach government how you trust government and how you see the world. And I think even this week, because I know this will air relatively soon, but who knows when someone might listen to this in, the, in a date perspective, but we're seeing, you know, folks who are protesting provincial and federal issues, they're protesting them on municipal property. What? For example, they're protesting municipal politicians who for right or wrong, have no say in those decisions. But we are the government building that is in their backyard. So that's where they're going to go. And whether that's right or wrong, well, it's happening. The so government of proximity is a double-edged sword sometimes. It's a good it and is. bad thing. Um, yeah. I just realized we are at a half hour. And I haven't oh, even goodness. gotten to my second segment yet, but I, <laughs> but before I do that, I do want to ask this question because I ask this a lot and I don't think people take into consideration this question a lot. Now you are a local official, you make a decision, you're in the grocery store the next day. And I can imagine that wears on people because you as a counselor are not full time. You, you make the job what you want. You you could do it 24 hours, seven days a week, but you don't get paid that. But you're no. on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You go out, yeah. you are an elected official. How do you balance the public life of a municipal councillor in a small town or a small community like chatham Kent? And I know geographically it is a large area with just being Allison, because 
you want your downtime too, but you can't just go run in to grab milk one day at the grocery store without taking 20 minutes or three hours <laughs> to do it. So how do you balance the life of a municipal politician in a local setting? Well, it's certainly a work in progress, Chris. I mean, <laughs> and, and you can ask me, ask me again in four years if I, you know, how, how that works. But a year in, it's definitely something that I am still figuring out. I don't find it, I don't mind it, to be honest. I, I enjoy talking to people. I mean, I think the nature of many folks who run for elected office, if you don't like talking to people, you are probably not really like, it's not going to be a good fit for you because you are you are on a lot of the time and i have not been overwhelmed like the paparazzi showing up at my door kind of thing like i have not found that to be a real issue yet generally speaking and and if i have to be somewhere and i can't speak to someone i will tell them that and usually they're fine with that you know i'm on my way to a meeting or i'm i'm sorry i can't talk to you right now can like here's my card can you please call or email me and we can talk about this at length so, and most folks are totally fine with that. But for me, the balance is still a work in progress. I have, uh, my parents have a family cottage on Lake Erie, just about half an hour from where I am sitting. And so I go there a lot um, <laughs> and just just to chill out. And I also, you know, I also have a real, and, I've, and I would recommend this to anyone, especially f- you know, new elected officials, find your group of supporters and people who are doing the same thing as you. I know, I think some of your other interviewees have mentioned this, but I have been very lucky to find primarily through social media at first, several female counselors who were also running at the same time I was. And we all connected on social media like Lindsay Wilson and Kate Leatherbarrel and Angela Caputo, the the four of us really connected early on. And since since then, more like-minded, progressive, smart, capable, amazing women have, we've all connected. And having those women to talk to has been a game changer. And it's been helpful that they're not in Chatham-Kent because they have a different perspective it can sometimes provide sort of sober second thought to things that I am up to my eyeballs in, right? And they can, they're not, so they can answer from a different perspective and say, have you thought about this? Have you tried that? Like, do you have a bylaw for this? Or have you talked to your CAO about that? So, and then through my role in FCM, I have colleagues across Canada that have been wonderful that I can call on. So I, that, the balance for me is having folks that I can talk to off the record and be honest and frank with, you know, I'm struggling. Like I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I don't know what to do. And that has been a huge, a huge help for me to have that support. I don't think I would be remotely as happy or as successful in my role so far without that, those folks in my corner. Deputy Mayor Wilson said the exact same thing. And I'm so happy that I'm putting your episodes <laughs> right beside come... each other. <laughs> um, so... we, we did not we did not coordinate our efforts, I promise. But I, I think we do all feel similarly about that. We've we've said it to each other before, so I'm sure we'd be happy to, to say it to you, too. I, I want to turn to my next segment. And before I ask this question, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor and I's opinions and conversation. I don't know why, but people seem to email me about this question a lot. But here we are. <laughs> Um, because I, I guess opinions don't matter in 2023, but I think they do. Um Counselor, in your opinion, at the time of recording this episode, because as you just said, it comes out a little bit later, but then people may be watching, listening or watching two months, a year from now. What is the biggest issue or issues facing the municipality of Chatham, Kent today? Well, it's if I had to narrow down to one, which is really not fair, Chris, by the way. One, no, a- no, you can say three. You can say two or three. I just like to say one. But if people are like, there's many. I know. It. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure every counselor would be like, OK, here's my laundry list. So, but I appreciate in the interest of time, uh, I would say infrastructure. 
aging infrastructure is a huge challenge for us. And I mean, if I had to do a second and third, uh, people experiencing homelessness and affordable housing, which is across the board, I think across Canada. But for us, those are the top, the, the three issues that really are providing, those are issues that we're really worried about. But for our community, Chatham can, as you mentioned, is just geographically quite large. It's 20, almost 2,500 square kilometers. So, and it's mostly rural. We have several large urban centers, Chatham, where I am, with the ward I represent is about 45,000 people, but the rest are smaller communities or entirely agricultural. So infrastructure is a huge issue because if our roads and bridges and drains are not functioning, are not up to repair, then our farmers can't deliver their product to market. And our farmers and agriculture in China is one of our, it's a huge like economic driver. So it's not a joke that, oh, well, my gravel road isn't sufficient or like there's a bridge out. These are barriers to our economic growth as a community. So we need to take it very seriously. Now, the only problem is that we have a very relatively small population in balance to our large geographic area. So we have our tax base is not huge to pay for all like these thousands of kilometers of roads. For example, we have 20% of all drainage systems in Ontario, which again is the reason why we can farm because we're draining, you know, tens of thousands of acres of farmland. So we, these are issues that are, and they're, they're expensive. It costs like almost a million dollars to build a kilometer of road in Chatham, Kent. And that adds up real quick. So our infrastructure, our asset management budget is 50% funded. So we have to make the tough decisions every budget season, almost every council meeting, quite frankly, about which, which roads we can repair right now, which bridges we can repair right now, which drains need assessing right now so and that's just that infrastructure piece we also have i mean like many communities the post-war boom is where you saw a huge amount of growth and you saw a lot of civic buildings being built like libraries and city halls you know water treatment plants these are all things that were often built in the big growth spurt that a lot of our community saw after the war and now well that was 70 as you said 70 80 years ago and these buildings are getting older and they need more repairs and they need more upkeep. And again, that costs money. So mm -hmm. a lot of these things are all happening at the same time, which is a lot of pressure on our budget. And that, and, you know, we have a situation where we had a relatively compared to previous years, tax increase, a larger tax increase last year in our budget. And I don't see how we avoid that moving forward, but high taxes are something that I get calls about all the time from folks. And it's it's a real balancing act to figure out how to address that. And especially with gov like government downloading from other levels of government, pushing that all onto our plate, we're having to pay for it. And it's it's not cheap. So that's really, that is a huge issue that I think we face. I think about it almost every day, truly. And it's it's definitely something that is not going away anytime soon. So I'm going to ask you to take off your counselor hat for a second, and I want you to put on your FCM hat for a second. Ooh, yay! Okay. Yeah. So FCM has been calling for a new fiscal framework for municipalities across Canada, and I know you guys just recently met virtually. It was supposed to be in Yellowknife, but due to the uh, wildfire yeah. situation, it had to be yeah. uh, turned virtually, which is still great because you still were able to meet. Um, I, I just got to ask, what, what are you looking for? So you talk about a new fiscal framework, and I've asked a lot of your board members this exact same question, Councillor Jeff Bob. Barato from Winnipeg. I just asked him. I ask every single FCM board member who comes on the show this question. What type of fiscal framework are you looking for? And what are you looking from, for from the province and federal government to help municipalities with? Well, I think, I mean, I, I want to give kudos to the FCM staff and the board members who have brought it to this point because I am a new board member. So I have had very little to do with this, the work that has been done to get it to this point. And I'm 
so proud of them because it's been a huge amount of work to really advocate for this and build the foundation for us to start rolling this out and really advocating with the federal government because I think to to put it into sort of a soundbite, we need a fair deal. We need a more equitable deal from the federal government. We need the support on major infrastructure issues um, that I just mentioned. I won't repeat them all, but we also need support on things like housing. There's a lot of levers the federal government, I mean, municipalities are creatures of the provinces for sure. And that's a role that we can never ignore. But the feds often step back and say, you know what, we'll let the municipalities and provinces duke it out and we'll just, we'll we'll stay back. And that we can't do that anymore. We cannot do that anymore. It's clear that we need the federal government at the table with us and we need us all to be working together and we need that support from them because municipalities are often, we're drowning under the weight of all of these issues being downloaded to us by these governments, but without the resources to deal with them. So from my perspective, it's, I mean, I say it's quite simple. We need a fair deal. And I don't think we have it right now from the federal government. And I, I, I can't speak to our advocacy efforts because we really are just starting the public work of doing this. And I'm really looking forward to our advocacy days in November when we go to Ottawa and we talk to our federal counterparts really excited about having that as my my first opportunity to do that because I think the municipalities uh, and FCM has made a very strong argument for why we need that support because we can't we can't do it alone we cannot do it alone and we're we're in some cases we're we're crumbling because of it and we that's that's not fair to any resident citizen of Canada to let municipalities sort of crumble under the weight of these responsibilities without being given the tools to address them effectively. I appreciate your candor there and your honesty there. And I, I want you to take off your FCM hat and now put back on your Chatham Kent hat for a second. Um, <laughs> and I want to, I, I want to talk about something you just said there, but from a Chatham Kent perspective, um, times are tough and you know that, and you, you know that people are struggling. There's an affordability crisis across this country right now that we have not seen in my lifetime. We, I might have, but I just don't remember it. And I, I can say that being almost 40. Um, I, I, I look at people struggling, and I know municipalities are trying to balance the needs and wants right now with what their community needs and what their community wants are. And then there's the new category that municipalities are trying to figure out is what can we hold off on until we get through this affordability crisis? Now, municipalities still have to operate. They still have to deliver services. You're heading into, if not already started, your budget cycle, sitting down and having these tough conversations. How tough do you think and how tough is it for you going into this the meeting, these meetings and going, okay, I'm going to have to make some tough choices. And I know it's going to impact some people's pocketbooks that who are living paycheck to paycheck or are on the brink of losing their house. Is it tough to be a counselor in this uncertain time when municipalities don't have an unlimited supply of money and they don't have a, a endless checkbook like the federal and provincial governments because you have to balance your budget every single year? Yeah, that is a, that is a huge question. Um, the last budget session, yeah, we are going into ours fairly soon. Uh, but it's something that I've thought about constantly because how do you grow your community without investing in it? And how do you make it successful and healthier for everyone without investing in it? But where are you where are you getting those dollars from? It's from you and me, right? So and I have had calls from people on fixed incomes that when I when we when we finished budget sessions of the last year and they and we announced the tax increase and I got a lot of calls from folks that were not sort of complaining about the tax increase in the sense of just I'm going to complain about taxes just because that's what I do they they would say I genuinely can't afford this like I need help I I cannot afford this I am on a fixed income I am already living so close to the line 
that I cannot afford even a small increase. Because when you sort of, often when you boil down the taxes to an individual level, it may not be that much per month or that much per year. But for, for some, that is a very privileged place to be in. And not everyone lives in that place of privilege. And when I heard from people who, where I had to give them information about how we have payment plans for taxes and how there are certain tax relief programs for seniors and different things along those lines, I thought, yeah, that's real. That is real impacts of my decision when, you know, we voted in our budget sessions on that tax increase. So that weighed heavily on me and it will continue to. I don't know how we get around that because we have major expenses in this community that I've already gone gone over. Yeah. And we have, and every community does. I mean, Chatham Ken is nowhere near unique, but it really, when you know that there are people that will be negatively impacted in on in their pocketbooks that they cannot afford, that is very that keeps you awake at night absolutely and i'm and smarter minds than me have you know tried to to figure out solutions and i'm always open to new ideas and new ways of approaching old issues but municipalities are given vert like almost no revenue tools and so we really are you know our hands are tied on so many levels. We can't go into, you know, we can't run a deficit. And not that I'm pro deficit, but we just, there's a lot of the tools that other levels of government can do to pay their bills. We can't. And so that goes on to the taxpayer and the taxpayer often is in a, in a position where they, it's a struggle for them to pay. So I, uh, that's Best a big of- one for me. Best of luck yeah. this budget season because I, I know a lot Thank of municipal you. municipal councilors are are in the exact same position as you, and I can only imagine the the back and forth that you do with yourself when you're going through these uh, types of decisions. But yeah, I, I, I want to turn to my last segment here, and it's my favorite segment. I I enjoy it because I like traveling within Canada. I know people are like, "Let's go to Cancun, let's go to LA." I'm like. Let's go to the middle of Canada and see what random things I can find. So Absolutely. as someone who is about probably going to try to get to Chatham Kent next summer, because I was just in Ontario this summer, but I'm going to try and get back there next summer. Um, where should I visit? What are some of the hidden gems in Chatham Kent that people need to stop and see as tourists through your community? Because we all know that people get on the 401 and they sometimes bypass communities, but why should they get off the 401 and visit Chatham Kent? Well, when you safely exit the 401 in Chatham Kent, there are a wealth of places for you to visit. We could have another hour to talk about that, but I will I will touch on a few highlights. And if anyone listening to this, you know, wants anything else, to, like has any other questions or ideas about traveling around Chatham Kent, please look me up. I'd be happy to chat. I'd be happy to give you a tour. So I think one of our most impressive and important assets in Chatham Kent are is our black history. We have three major black historical sites in Chatham Kent. Uh, the, the Buxton National Historic Site was uh, founded by people who were enslaved, escaping the U.S., uh, primarily leading up to the U.S. Civil War. And that uh, is still, st- like that still exists. Buxton is a, is a small community just about 10 minutes from where I sit and the descendants of former enslaved people still live there, still a thriving community. So that, and that's, and it's got a, the national historic site there is a museum there. There is a schoolhouse there. There is uh, a wealth of history in Buxton, uh, including, you know, but the Buxton school was considered so high class was integrated in the 1800s. It was an integrated school. It was so well respected for the quality of education. The first ever black certified physician, Dr. Anderson Abbott, was educated there. Just, you know, so this is no joke. This is important history. This is important Canadian history. We also have the Josiah Henson African Canadian Museum of History. If you've read the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, 
uh, was based loosely, and there's more scholarship that is clarifying how that was written, but loosely based on Josiah Henson, who was a real person, a real uh, advocate for the rights of Black Canadians. And his home is now the site of a museum about 20 minutes north of me in Chatham in Dresden, Ontario. There's also the CK Black History Mecca, which is in Chatham, uh, because that's our the there's a, the eastern end of Chatham was a real uh, mecca for Black residents, and Marianne Shad Carey, who was the first Black woman in North America to publish and edit a newspaper, operated her newspaper in that area for several years. So that to, that alone is amazing to me. But we also have Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie. We have the Thames River, the Sydenham River. If you like anything to do with waterways, whether it's swimming or sailing or canoeing or kayaking or hiking, an amazing way to do that. And last but not least, Chris, get ready. Chatham Kent invented pineapple on pizza. Whoa, 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 whoa. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, it's a very so, controversial uh, subject. It's a oh, very controversial. I, I love pineapple on pizza. Like that's my favorite thing. So I'm coming to Chatham Kent no matter what next year. Yes, <laughs> when you make... come to Chatham, you you know, look me up. We're gonna have some pineapple on pizza, and I hope we don't create an international incident, a cross border but... incident. But yeah, I'm that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, That's just a very tiny sampling, but there's a, even more than that. But those are some of the highlights, I think. I, I want to turn to my uh, sort of last question because I am cautious of time here and I know you are a busy counselor. So I want to ask, in your opinion, what makes Chatham Kent such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Chatham Kent is a very caring community. We have a quality of life that is second to none when you can within 15, 20 minutes be at a great lake, you can golf 10 months of the year. We have a great climate, quite a relatively mild climate. So you can do a lot of out of outdoor activities. We have a very vibrant and engaged economic development team who will help you build your business here, whether you're an entrepreneur or a large employer. But bottom line to me is that Chatham Kent is a caring community. We come together when things are tough. We come together when folks are struggling. When someone, you know, if there's been a fire or someone has cancer or someone needs help, we show up. And that to me is really what has impressed me. When you run for council, you meet so many people you may never meet otherwise. And there's lots of difference of opinions, don't get me wrong. But when it comes down to brass tacks, people show up when they need to, and we care about each other. And I think nowadays, when there is a lot of negativity out there, and there's a lot of struggle, and people are hurting, and we're coming out of a pandemic, and we've had a rough time, us humans. But we have come, you know, we have shown up when it matters, and you know, we have a very caring, compassionate community that I am proud to be part of. Counselor, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for a an amazing conversation. Uh, I, I, you, I I never really know I never know what I'm going to get when I talk to municipal counselors, and I am finding that municipal counselors across this country are so amazing. So thank you so much for a serving your community, b for joining me on my show, and. See, just being an all around awesome person, because this was a great conversation. So thank you. I really enjoyed it too, Chris. Thank you for the chance to speak with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of making municipality issues matter again. Now, as we wrap up, I hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate worlds of municipal politics and municipal government from today's interview. 
Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with this show, Cross Border Interviews, but all of our shows, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. But you're also playing an intricate role, a vital role, if that, in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission of making municipal issues prominent on a national stage, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca and clicking on that support us now page. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content like today's interview you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking.